Well, hey there, folks. Welcome to The Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price. I'm your host. And if, as always, if you're listening to this on audio on any of the podcast affiliates from Spotify to iTunes to SoundCloud and Google Play, you can also jump over to YouTube and watch this online. And if you do, be sure to comment, share, like it, no matter where you're watching it or listening to it. I'm grateful that you're here, and uh, of course, as always, grateful for the opportunity to continue doing this. Uh, but before we get into the introduction, I want to hit a couple of uh, housekeeping details on the podcast. Um, as always, check out the, the music. You can listen to the full song, the theme song from the podcast called Clouds by Modern Nations. Check them out at modernnationsmusic.com. Then check out the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences, a boutique integrative practice that my wife and I started a while back, and we are growing. We're in the process of moving locations, and there's a lot that's going to be happening there, so go check out that site. As always, I'm thankful, I'm thankful for the opportunity that, uh, that that practice provides this project. Um, then the other piece is this project, The Sacred Speaks. Check out the website, which is currently under construction, should be up in about a month or two. We've been working really hard for a long time to get that up and rolling. So as far as building this community, there's a lot of wonderful opportunities to engage and connect, and those will be growing as, uh, as the project um, expands itself. Okay, so the, uh, today's participant is Jose Leal from Monterrey, Mexico. He's a psychotherapist. He's worked in a lot of different contexts, but I've been really excited to talk to him because I'm involved with the Young Center in Houston. I look them up at Young Houston, J-U-N-G Houston dot org. And uh, he's a, a teacher there, and, but there's one particular individual named Michael Gregg. Uh, Michael sings Jose's praises and uh, on, a, on a trust, on, on trusting Michael, because I'm quite fond of him. I talked with Jose, and I'm grateful that I did. So uh, let me give you a little background on Jose before we jump into it. One of the things that really attracted me to his work is his interest in fairy tales. And, uh, and we, did, we, we set up the episode by reading Sleeping Beauty, or I, I read Sleeping Beauty. It's not very long. Please, I, I recommend you read it. Check the show notes for information. I've got a link to um, both the Wikipedia page on Sleeping Beauty and then also a, um, uh, a site that provides the, uh, the text version of Sleeping Beauty. It's a quick read, very quick read. And, and we, we kind of just track it a little bit, so it would be helpful for this episode if you would do that first. Let me read his bio, and then we'll get to a couple of details, and then set it up and go. Jose has a master's in Jungian and post-Jungian studies from the University of Essex, where Andrew, Sa- Andrew Samuels was his academic supervisor, and a master's in systemic psychotherapy from the Milton Erickson Institute from Monterrey. Since 2013, he's trained with Dr. Carlarissa Pincola Estes, he works as a psychotherapist in private practice and writes the column, The Spiritually Ambivalent Therapist for Thresholds, a journal of psychotherapy and spirituality from the British Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy. Again, link below for the journal and link below for the Wikipedia page. Also check out the link at the Jung Center. It's a class that just passed that uh, Jose taught on the seven gates to the underworld and the descent of Inanna. And you may be able to get that online, but uh, I, put, I put that here just so you can get to the Young Center's website, uh, but also follow some of the teachers that are there teaching. It's a wonderful opportunity to connect, and uh, most of it is online. Uh, a good portion of it is online, so you can find a lot of the classes uh, available there. What else? Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Jose for, for participating. We had a, a, an interesting conversation that spanned from attachment and spiritually integrated psychotherapy to the nature of therapy and meditation, spiritual practice, religion, um, healing and healers, the shadow side of spiritual work and the healing professions, shamanism, fairy tales, on and on. Uh, so hang out, and uh, as always, at the end, listen to the full selection of clouds. And thanks, Jose, for participating, and thank you for being here. And uh, for now, we'll leave it there. I wonder where you like to start when you present. And let me let me go to the intro for, for you to kind of set the listener up on who you are and what you do. And at this point, I would have read your your bio too. Mm-hmm. Um, but w- let's start there. Why don't you start in just letting us know who you are and your areas of interest and what brings you to the work that you do currently. And then I'll start asking questions primarily about uh, the archetype 
uh, about how these um, energies show up in uh, fairy tales and mythology and why we would pay attention to stories like that and what they mean to us. So I'll, I'll set you up now to just give us, a, give us a bit of who you are and then we'll dive in. Sure, thank you. Well, my name is Jose Leal. Uh, I live in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, I was born here. Uh, so I did my master's in ethics in Jungian psychology. Uh, that was 2014, I started. And uh, ethics was a fascinating experience. I did my dissertation on how therapy and spirituality could collaborate or hurt each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my thesis supervisor was Andrew Samuels. So that was also a fascinating experience to, to have. Yeah. Um, then I came back to Monterrey and did a master's in systemic psychotherapy. And then uh, I started working at a high school. I was a high school counselor and combined that with a private practice and teaching several groups on mythology and fairy tales. And mm -hmm. then I landed in the Jung Center by accident on a trip to Houston. I had no idea the Jung Center was there. Uh, so I went, I, I went to the center, I loved it. And then I wrote them and they said, sure, come in and teach whatever you want. And uh, they were very open and uh, to my ideas and my interest. I've also been training for the past eight years. Well, not counting 2020 and 2021, but for the previous eight years, uh, I was training with Dr. Clarissa Pinkola Estes. She's one of my greatest influences. She's the reason why I'm a Jungian. And um, and so that's where my interest in fairy tale also started. Um, my interest in spirituality started when I was 12. I learned to meditate. Uh, my best friend was, well, is one of my best friends. She's 12 years older than me, and her parents were meditation teachers. So I learned from them when I was 12, and then I continued learning. And I started teaching meditation workshops um, when I was in university. And, well, I, I stopped a couple of years ago, but uh, but I could continue doing that because it's fascinating and I love it. Um, and so now I'm, in, now I'm in private practice with uh, teenagers, adults, and couples. And I continue to teach privately and or in centers like the Jung Center. I don't teach at the high school anymore, and I'm not a counselor anymore. Uh, and my current interests are how culture... Well, it's always been how culture, society, history, how everything around us shape uh, human behavior, the links and the relationships that we form, uh, what made us human, and, and how all of the, those influences are still here. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose or how can we find purpose in suffering, uh, questioning everything around us and try to find uh, whatever whatever works and is true and doesn't harm anyone. Um, one, of my, one of the things that fuels my interests most of the time is anger. So things that make me angry, uh, I usually get interested in understanding them and trying to, to find out ways of dealing with them. Uh, I love stories. I'm fascinated by stories. By every single interest, I, I can read about whatever. And uh, so biology, paleontology, society, anthropology, I, I love learning about everything. I don't believe in the guilty pleasure. So I think that everything that sparks interest is valid. <laughs> and, uh, and, and yeah, so I try to combine all of that and, uh, and try to bring that into, our, into my teaching and into my work as a therapist and to, to find new ways of, of relating to ourselves and to others and to, to learn and grow from that and, uh, and seek what interests us, what makes us curious, what makes us mad, and what really connects us to life. Thank you for that. That's fun. You and I have a lot in common, and uh, I'm eager to unpack that with you. So I want to read this, the experiences and spiritual practices in psychotherapy, a critical and theoretical, a critical, theoretical, and empirical study. And uh, this was a this was a rewarding paper to read, Jose. I, I, I enjoyed that. That may be a decent starting point. How do you feel about that? Just to kind of set us up by talking about some of the terms, what what Jungian and post-Jungian mean, and some of these influences in your writing. Again, I, I told you earlier that this is I, I haven't visited a lot of these topics in the podcast since very early on, you know, because so it's very nice to return to this material. The other thing I want to plant is as we explore archetypes, uh, there was a question online that somebody um, posted about uh, Jungian theory wanting to understand Jung and looking at the nature of good and evil. And I wonder if we can dive into some of that too. But 
Could you could you just kind of give an overview of this study that you did on psychotherapy and spirituality? Yes. Um, be- when I was in Essex, the dissertation, I saw the dissertation as an opportunity to combine my two, my two current biggest in, interests and passions, psychotherapy and spirituality. And I've always been fascinated by spirituality, but I, I've always been very wary of its dangers because I think it, both therapy and spirituality can be very dangerous areas and pursuits because if they're not contained, if uh, the people engaging in them are not well-trained, or if there's a lot of contamination, uh, personal or cultural or social contamination, I think that it can be quite problematic. So my interest was to see how they can collaborate, but also seeing the areas of dangers, the blind spots, when one could override the other. So my interest was to, in the dissertation, was to sort of talk about spirituality in a broad way, that it could be as inclusive as possible, but with very specific elements to it so that we could all relate in a very concrete and practical way, but that anyone could could fit in there. Because from the Jungian perspective, we all have a spiritual or, in Jung's word, a religious instinct, which is the need mm-hmm. to be related to something that is greater than us. And that can be whatever. It doesn't necessarily need to be um, a deity or a god or, or, or a supernatural being. And then I wanted also to ground that in, in the stories of people. So that's why I did three in-depth interviews to see how all of that would work with the material and not leave it just in, in the theoretical approach and just say, okay, well, this is how it should be done and this is what everyone says about it and this is my combination of this and now I have a dissertation. I wanted to bring all of that into reality and see, well, the, at least with the people that have experienced these two areas, how does all of this reflect? And um, Jungian and post-Jungian, well, uh, post-Jungian means having a critical distance to Jung. So one of the greatest values that I that I still carry from Essex was that for the first month and a half, all everything every lecturer did for that month and a half was to demystify Jung, criticize him, question him, deromanticize Jung. Um, Andrew Samuels, I remember in one of our in one of his introductory lectures, he said, "Well, Jung is great if you want to find individuation, but so is." going for an ice cream like right? you know don't ignore the simple life and and an ice cream can be much more interesting than Jung and uh and I loved that that cynical critical spirit I was fascinated by it uh because I think it 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 helps us draw the value from the theory but Jungian psychology can also be very dangerous as well as the concept of the archetype uh and very contentious so this critical sense was uh, what I wanted to hold throughout the entire dissertation and arrive to perspectives to understand this concept and carry it further, but not to arrive to a final explanation or conclusion of saying this is how it should be done, because I think that's when we lose um, whatever keeps our interests alive, whenever it becomes prescriptive and dogmatic. Oh, absolutely. As religion and spirituality, and I, uh, can can we can we go? Let's go there. Let's criticize it first. What were the critiques that stood out as uh, as de romanticizing and mystifying you? Yeah. Well, um, that there are many versions and readings of Jung that throughout his writing he changes uh, points of view and perspectives that he can't be justified all the time and that he was a human being with, uh, with a human life and, and, and human limitations. But there are certainly uh, myth, myth-making uh, elements towards the figure of Jung and uh, his quote-unquote autobiography and uh, the problems that some texts entail, the, some of his problems as a, as a historical figure, some of his shortcomings, how he could have exaggerated certain stories, um, the influence, how we can never uh, really take him away from Freud and uh, and his story with psychoanalysis and with Freud. Uh, and also the this idea of, of th- that can happen in the Jungian world where where if you take something that Jung says, now it's, it becomes law, and of course not. So uh, that just because you're quoting and putting CW8 Call, mm-hmm. Colon 241, that doesn't mean anything. It's one idea from the man, and we can just, we need to update it and bring it here. And um, 
and I think that that was really valuable to say, well, we can't go with this man and saying he's a guru, he's a human being uh, with very interesting ideas. But when he came up with those ideas, it was a hundred years ago. So we need to revise that and, and connect it to today's world. And another thing that Andrew also says, and uh, I have heard him in the following years and conferences is that Jungians or post-Jungians, that we need to be promiscuous and be with everyone because otherwise we'll just talk to Jungians. <laughs> so, and that, that is his word. He uses that in, in, in a SWOT analysis he made of, of, Jung, uh, of Jungian studies. And I think it's true. We need to be in dialogue with other disciplines and other areas. And, uh, and in Essex, although everything was very critical and academically rigorous, it was very open. As, it is one of the only places that I've seen this People from all of the different psychoanalytic or therapeutic perspectives coexisting in peace. I would get teached and lectured by classic Freudians, by Lacanians, uh, by, ther- by Jungians that also had a systemic formation, by Kleinians. And we all coexisted and we all talked to each other and we all knew where we were coming from. But there was a lot of areas for collaboration which made for a really interesting crash with reality once I came back to Mexico. Mm. But, uh, but I think there's a lot of value in that plural and open dialogue where, again, it's not finding the right answers, it's creating and collaborating and innovating and seeing everyone's strengths and shortcomings. So all I wanted to bring all of that into the dissertation and, um, and into my work. I don't think that if Andrew also said she was a big influence. Uh, he also said one time, and I agree with him, the theoretical rigidity was almost equivalent to malpractice. And, and I think mm-hmm. that's right. Because mm-hmm. if we're rigid in a theory, particularly in a clinical scenario, then who are we to say that our client needs to feed what someone else wrote 20, 30, 100 years ago? Why is their experience need to fit there instead of helping, using theory to expand, to help, to make hypotheses, to to try to make connections, but never to reduce that person to a psychological explanation. Mm-hmm. Well, and diagnosing is kind of the the leading approach. You know, we 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 do mm-hmm. we we have a material materially fixed perspective where yeah. we categorize people in these extremely reductive containers. That at time, I mean, I'm not I'm not a total. I'm not totally against it because I think at times no, no, absolutely not. People are empowered by realizing, oh my God, there's a name for that, and yeah, now absolutely. I, and the I, I think a lot of times people can use, um, you know, the, the diagnostic diagnostic uh, criterion as a kind of container that is limiting as opposed yeah. to expanding. Yes, and but again, I think the other side can also be quite dangerous to just make everything unstructured, unnamed, and, yeah. and entirely subjective. So that can also be horrible. And that's what also drove me to to the Jungian perspective, which is this constant strive of, main, of maintaining contradictory perspectives together and seeing the value in them. So I, I, I absolutely, I'm not saying I'm, I'm against diagnostic or anti what I know. I think di- diagnosis is very important. Definitely psychiatry has a very important role in, in mental health too. And, uh, and medication absolutely has a very important role. And it can be quite grounding to, to know that there's a name for something mm-hmm. and to know that there are lines of actions that have worked before. But then again, that should also be individualized and created with the client or patient that you're working with. So mm-hmm. um, the, the annoying thing the unions we always do is to say that, well, why can't both or many of the things coexist. And I think that's the real challenge. How can we bring all of that together? Not to be resolved, but that it can coexist. Yeah. Uh, so you, I guess I don't know where to go there because I'm, I'm still kind of hung on, I'm hanging on to this period of Essex and all these different influences that were coming together, this multidisciplinary platform. Would would you speak for a minute, just for anybody who doesn't know, why that is such, why is why that's an issue and why that's unique that there are multidisciplinary, that a space like that is such a positive place? Because um, yeah, just speak to that for a moment. Yeah. So in my experience, both as a person that has been in therapy and as a therapist, is that well, war therapy wars I think are useless 
uh, going in, into, well, this perspective is better, or this school is better, or we mm-hmm. work in a better way than you. I think it's it's arrogant and limiting because who who can have the answer for how the entire world experiences life? It's just I think it's ridiculous to assume that. And in in my experience before and after Essex, um, there's there's a lot of attitudes that close dialogue and go like, well, yeah, but I don't believe in psychoanalysis. Well, it's not a belief system Mm -hmm. uh it's a technique and we can draw things from it that are interesting and great well i don't i think cbt is quite limiting okay sure but at the same time no it it offers wonderful things and uh and it's helped a lot of people too so uh in Essex, this coexistence of different traditions therapy traditions and they also asked us to move beyond the union lens in all Mm -hmm. of our research projects and to draw from different areas and I think that that keeps us, I think that attitude helps to ma- maintain humility, knowing that our perspective doesn't have all of the answers and it will never have them, that it's a personal interest and that is fine. I'm a Jungian because I like it, not because I right. think it will be better for everyone else. And, and I can work authentically from there. But I, if I do something that would benefit others and, and that's it just for, you know, for market reasons, oh, everyone wants this, I'll train like that. I, I would never do that because I would not be effective. I would hate it. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that in the consulting room, well, clients are there with their suffering and they don't care about our theories. They don't care about, oh, this is more effective than blah, blah, blah. They care that they're listened to, that we're competent enough to know what to do and what not to do, or when we can't help, that we're open enough that we can discover things with them. And, um, and that they're listened to and that they won't be harmed. And if we fight among us and saying, well, you know, your concept is worse because mine, blah, 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 then how can we translate that into the consulting room? Oh, yeah, we're going to fight in our academic and clinical formation, but then we're, we're, we're going to be open and caring and just contradictory. Mm-hmm. So, so that was quite refreshing in Essex, the rigor and openness, the coexistence of rigor and openness. And I haven't seen that anywhere else. Uh, well, I'm not saying that in, it doesn't exist in the entire world, but in my experience, I haven't seen that here in Mexico or in other places that I've been and that I've worked. What is the kind of attitude that you grew up with around therapy? Uh, it was certainly it was taboo and uh, it was uh, there was a stigma to it and nobody Nobody openly admitted that. Uh, my first experience in a counseling scenario was when I was in high school. I went to the school counselor. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, I was desperate. And uh, it was helpful. Uh, not as helpful as a therapeutic process would we, have been. But it was... We need to note how unique that is for a, an adolescent to, go, to voluntarily go into therapy, certainly in a culture where it feels a little taboo. Yeah, well, I've I've always been a bit counter counterculture here in Monterrey <laughs> and with my family. Uh, usually, my my strategy, because of course, my parents were mortified. Like, why do you want to go to therapy? Uh, they, they were scared. They <laughs> to talk understand. about you. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And they were like, "But well, everything's fine. Why do you want to go there?" Blah blah blah. And when I asked to go to a formal private therapist. I remember my mom saying, like, why? Why do you want to do this? She was genuinely scared. And uh, my one of my strategies was to always escalate things. So I would say, like, well, I can go now that I that I don't have any real issues. Uh, <laughs> and I used several examples, horrifying examples of, of those real issues. <laughs> and, and, you know, we can prevent all of this. Of course, none of that would have happened, I think. But I would always use this scare tactic to sort of get away with it. And then when I went to my first formal therapy process, I was, 19 and it was life-changing completely life-changing well what do you think was so life-changing about it not not to go into personal content but what what happened in the therapy what yeah what happened in the therapy and then i'd like you to talk about what therapy is through your perspective yeah well to have a place where you but everything could just come out and you could see it and uh and the person and the place served as a container and then that you could rearrange or learn or transform that and see the impact that had uh, on my everyday life. That was uh, very, that, that impacted me a lot. 
and it helped me a lot. And it brought a lot of different things together. I was growing up, I was finding myself, I was starting university. It was a place to also to bring all of the, what I had learned from my meditation practice and, and my spiritual practice and, and, and to see how all of that connected. And I think therapy, therapy, what to define therapy is always difficult, but I think mm -hmm. it has to be a relationship. It has to be a therapeutic relationship period, no other relationship polluting that. It has to be a place where we address the difficult aspects of, a person's life, the suffering, the pain, the conflicts, but also where we can address and see how this person managed to stay in this level of whatever, of health, of, of functionality, of up until now. They, I think everyone has uh, a lot of wisdom, a lot of resources, a lot of energy and untapped potential. So I think therapy can help them access their untapped potential. Um, it's a space of co-creation, absolutely. And I do believe that. But I think 99% of whatever happens in a therapeutic process is the client. It's not us imparting something saying, you know, I gave you this or no, it's just I was lucky enough to walk with you, not hurt you and see and probably try different processes that would have, that, that would give you answers, but the answers are just, are, are, are in them or in us, in the person that is doing all of the work and the process. So I think therapy is, it can be certainly, it can be also mystified as the one all be all solution for everything. And it mm -hmm. isn't, it is a tool, a method, a space of self-reflection and of healing and of addressing pathological aspects of our personality and of our lives and addressing conflicts. And it can be a place to learn, to grow, to transform, but knowing that it's not going to make life wonderful and, and, and pretty all the time, it's just going to help us, uh, digest and address whatever it is that we're facing. So I don't know, I, I can't provide a concrete uh, definition of therapy, but I think if therapy is something, I think it's that. It, yeah, to, just to add and to, to kind of vibe with you here, I, there's, I always wonder like, why can't I just go into the closet and say everything that I've never said out loud and just, <laughs> it, it, that's valuable. First of all, I do think that's valuable. Actually, somebody did go in, and that's what journaling is. You know, when you actually, yes. you know, explore, uh, it, it's a one of the things. In let me let me quote Jung for a second. The, in in uh, volume five, paragraph seventeen. I'm kidding, I, but I know it's in volume five. Um, he says he's talking about non-directed and directed thought, and that our mind is constantly moving and and going all over the monkey mind, as the Buddhists talk about. And there is something about directing your your the 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 instrument of your consciousness in a self reflective way onto your life and the threads of your life, and then to speak. It's not just thought, right? Because thought and words and action are all different on some level. And so when we begin to put behavior to these interior expressions. We, we become a kind of observer in a, in a different way of our inner experience. But then there's something about having a partner. And, and in your estimation, what is the value of, because I'm, I'm totally with you and that it's not like you're some guru figure who's giving somebody the, you know, do this 10 times and dance on one foot and then, you know, don't think that way again. Although that's some of it, you know, yeah. sometimes we are, but, but what is it? What, what what do you think it is in the relationship that allows change to happen? I think having someone that can listen deeply and with an open mind, with a curiosity, with compassion, with a wanting to learn, um, someone that it's not going to that's not going to judge, uh, that won't attack or won't harm, that can hold whatever it is that you bring into the session that doesn't have an expectation of you of how you should behave or how, what you should say i think that is incredibly valuable for all of this process to happen and i think that's what we're what we're supposed to do and also to have someone safe enough that you can relive or re-experience a lot of these conflicts with and mm -hmm. navigate through them and just say well i'm not 
I'm not going to go into your conflict and retaliate or avoid or criticize or judge or whatever. Let's explore this. Why is it that this is making you angry or sad or, you know, you've already talked about this in four or five relationships and maybe we can explore what's happening there. Just a compassionate external view that can also be challenging, but I think that challenge needs to be very delicate and mm -hmm. it, it, we certainly can be strong in therapy and confront our client, absolutely. But the intention behind that should always be um, growth, compassion, understanding. And I think also someone that can listen to the other. And I think the great value of a therapist too, and I think it was Hillman who said that, that the failure of the analyst, yeah. as well as the love of the analyst, but the failure of the analyst is what ultimately heals. And I think someone that can fail you, some, but fail you as a human being, mm -hmm. and then and then you can work through that. And I think that can also be quite dangerous because as a therapist, I do believe that as therapists we need extensive psychotherapeutic processes, our own training, and I mm -hmm. think beyond that, I, I do I do think that it has to be uh, on and off, but for life, uh, because we won't stop understanding and learning and, and, and growing. And I think it'd be very dangerous because if we don't have our stuff at least identified, we can certainly identify with our clients or retaliate or do horrible things in the therapeutic alliance. Um, and that's part of the job to, to know how to navigate our murky waters and, and try not to contaminate uh, their process as much with our murky waters. Yeah. It, I, that gets to the next phase that I think is important is that there will be enactments in the relationship that certainly touch on and may may wound or may reactivate a wound that gets to play itself out that you can then be exploratory as opposed to identified. Yeah. And I think the real concern about a therapist that hasn't done their work is that they can get kind of pulled into a dynamic and become the... Uh, the the other polarity to whatever the the client is acting out and then it becomes a re-traumatizing experience because the individual is kind of imagining that this person is going to help or support or be all these things that you're talking about but now they're just being an asshole like my father yeah and okay. and, and i i tell i feel like this is kind of a public service announcement for therapy but great it it seems as if I, like what, one of the things that I tell the folks that come into my office is don't edit. And I think that's one of the hardest things to do yeah. is to totally share yourself. And if, even if you're saying, I, I fucking hate you right now, I want you to say that because I'm going to do my best not to fall into the dynamic. And I'm going to look at you and say, tell me where that comes from. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, or, whoa, that stirs a lot of anger in me. I'm wondering if, uh, if that's how, if you experience people that are angry and let's, of course, people say don't engage the transference, but I don't know. I just like to, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm totally aligned with the, the idea that the rupture in the relationship brings about some great transformation if there's enough trust and connection in the relationship. Yeah, if for the, exactly. To repair and to apologize when we screw up. As totally. Therapy. Yeah, totally. Because we will. It's, it's not a matter of when. It's, or no, it's not a matter of it. When we screw up with every client, <laughs> I think we should apologize and acknowledge that. I laugh at that just because I, you know, I'm even in some of that right now with people where we're we're looking at the humanness that emerges and then how we are human because we don't I, I, generalizations. We don't do a very good job of the very simple things. I feel angry. Like we don't do a good job of communicating that because we are we either move away from it or overwhelm somebody because of it. Yeah. So one thing that we're kind of tracking here is is therapy. What is therapy? And when you were a young person, nineteen years old, what do you think led to such a powerful shift for you? Um. Well, the first time I went to a counselor's office, I was fifteen because I felt quite lost and angry at that moment. And it was, it helped because it allowed for a place for all of this chaos to mm -hmm. emerge. Mm -hmm. I also had meditation at that point in my life and that really helped me a lot. So a relationship with my inner world was what saved me. 
uh, with the books I enjoyed and read, with the music I listened to, with nature, with um, with meditation, with the symbols that would engage me, uh, with all of this inner imagery that would just naturally come up. That that was incredibly healing and and containing, and it it saved me in countless ways. And then when I enter a therapy room, um, I think all of that found grounding and roots and started to become something else and started to to create this launching pad for for into my uh, 20s and i felt lost because well monterrey is it's a big city we're like five million right now it's a business uh center so there's lots of industry lots of money lots of people lots of things to do um but it's a society that has it has many good things but it has very rigid paths of how of what of how someone should be uh and uh in everything work uh gender roles religion uh community life in absolutely everything so it's not that i was counterculture because i was this just you know mythical being that arrived here it was just that i had different interests period so finding myself that lost in in a lot of of the places that i would be every day led me to try to find a place where I could understand myself. And then, of course, I've, I've always had loving family and friends that care for me, but but at times that those relationships were challenging, particularly in my teenage years. Um, and I was very, well, I, I did everything different from my family. So my family has a family business. I've never been in that family business. Um, but I, I, I do everything in a different way. My interests, the way I live, everything. So therapy was a place to to understand that and to and to and to stop the conflict with that, to resolve a lot of my own issues and claim part of my adulthood and my adulthood by being responsible for whatever the conflict left left in me. And and well, I need I still need to have a, a relationship with the people I love, with my shortcomings and their shortcomings, and find ground where we can grow and, and connect. And I think therapy, after the process of 19, after that, and because I've been in four processes in total, that's what I think I've all of them have provided, this kind of, of learning of space, of growth, and, and of connecting with, with everyone that mattered to you. And also people that don't matter and you hate. It's made me understand why I hate them, uh, to not you know, engage in, in, in those feelings. And to find a common ground in respect, and respect can be, well, we're not meant to have a relationship, but I wish you well, and I'm not going to harm you, and I'm not going to enter into conflict with you. Tupac once said, uh, when, when you're my enemy, it doesn't mean that I don't want you to eat. It means that I don't want you to eat at my table. And, exactly that. And I, think, I think that's wisdom from a guy who is pretty involved in some aggression. Uh, to be so yeah. eloquent, you know. Uh, so, so you've got a history in meditation. That's an interesting thing for a young yeah. person. Uh, I mean, how did you stumble? I mean, I guess you had a friend and their parents, but yeah, that th you stayed with it. That's really interesting because anybody who's meditated know that it's not about like uh, a, a nice outfit on the mountainside smiling. I mean, it's a pretty yeah. grueling experience. Go go into that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it's <laughs> at first I had to do it. Uh, in hiding like, to keep it a secret so I didn't tell anyone <laughs> I was doing that uh, you're a closeted meditator Jose this at is uh... 12, yeah absolutely at 12 everyone was like what <laughs> meditation you know shut up uh you know, yeah no, no no one took me seriously at that at that moment and they would just be suspicious of it so I was a closeted meditator from like 12 to maybe 15 16 <laughs> so I have my candles and my incense and all of that and I would just you know hide it and then meditate and well, yeah, I'm just watching TV, but I'm actually meditating or, you know, stuff like that. Because uh, it was questioned and frowned. And my <laughs> friends were like, well, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> uh, my family, too, they were a bit shocked. And in Mexico, um, we all have a, well, not we all, but it's very common to have close relationship to your extended family. So I would mm -hmm. see my uncles and cousins and grandparents on a weekly basis. Uh, so you know, all of all of that. 
social canary was included in the hiding of the meditation. At the beginning, because I've always had intense feelings for everything and been very passionate and intense mm. about, mm. about everything. At the beginning, meditation had a really calming effect, a really, really calming effect. And I think that's what made me feel safe and contained. And then, of course, mm. I started engaging as I grew up. As I grew older, I started engaging in, in conflicts. But at the beginning, because I was 12, it was very playful. It was very, it was very, this is my place where I can escape and my imagination can run wild and I can learn from my imagination and I can just feel at peace for 30 minutes, an hour, and then carry on. And as I grew older, that's finding the conflict that you find when you're growing up. Meditation will just sort of shifted into this mm. introspection and this questioning of, of my own conflicts and the conflict I had with everyone. And that's also when therapy arrived and, and they both of them started coexisting and, and working uh, with each other in me. I'm still stuck. My, I guess I'm, I'm stuck in my own adolescence when I'm thinking, yes, yeah, some people go to the closet to masturbate. Some people go to the closet <laughs> to smoke pot. <laughs> You know, you're, yeah. you're, you I are. I did it too many things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that's great. Hey, uh, doctor, I feel so conflicted. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm vipassana-ing in the, uh, in the closet. Uh, so where, where does, um, wh where does this little seed of, therapy, religion, and spirituality start to emerge because you, did you go right, but yeah, to fill in that gap real quick, how you ended up from 19 and, and where you are today. Oh, well, that was a detour. Um, I was still lost and I've, ha I've had so many interests throughout my life. Uh, if you see any of my bookshelves, you'll go, once I, I have a story about this, once I, 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 I went to a Barnes & Noble. And I paid, and the cashier said, are, are all of this for the same person? Is all of this for you? And I said, yes. And they were like, okay, this is an, an interesting selection. Because I have very, very wide mm -hmm. interests. So when I was in university, um, I went into a university here, here in Monterrey called Tech de Monterrey, which is one of the most important universities in, well, in the country and in Latin America. And uh, they didn't have much majors that I liked. And I, that was my only option to study in. So I chose at that moment uh, to major in international affairs, which was the, the study plan was more social sciences. So mm. I had economy, literature, anthropology, sociology, um, politics, history, and all of those topics were fascinating because it was uh, understanding humanity and, and our collective and also mm. individual side. So I kept with the meditation part too. And then I graduated and I kept doing my meditation workshops and I started reading a lot of psychology. Uh, I discovered Women Who Run With The Wolves when I was, I think, 20 or 21. And I was just completely shocked and transformed and blown away by her writing. Uh, yeah. Dr. Seth has been one of the greatest influences I've ever had. So I followed her work. I also followed the work of Dr. Jean Shinoda Boulen mm -hmm. and I started reading Jung. And then I went to a training with Dr. Steph and uh, I realized a lot of my, well, the, when I first arrived to that training at 25, they genuinely asked me if I was lost and I needed direction because it was like, well, you're not clearly not here. And then the people from the registry, they knew uh, I was coming and they were like, oh, no, no, she's here. And they just you know, were very nice. That's, that's because of your age, correct? Yes, that was because of my age and because I was a guy, a 25-year-old guy <laughs> entering that retreat. I relate, yeah. So, uh, but what, I, what was really enlightening was that a lot of the people that I met and interacted with really opened my world because a lot of them were therapists with very, uh, with different backgrounds too. And they were like, oh, well, I, I used to work in this area and then I trained as a therapist or I was a journalist or I was a teacher, I was a science uh, teacher. And so that opened my eyes and said, well, oh, I can do this. I, abs I, I can. So that started shifting things and said, okay, uh, I need a master's in Jungian studies. And I, there's only two places where I can do that. I've always loved the UK uh, and British culture. So I mm -hmm. said, I 
this is a great opportunity to be in the UK and do Jungian study and then train as a therapist in Monterrey. And that's where I redefined my professional and academic path. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to, to be able to do that and, uh, and have a supporting family that helped me achieve that. They didn't understand it, but <laughs> they, were, they supported it, which is, I think that's how I can define my relationship with my family. We don't understand you, but we'll support you. Uh, and uh, so I was able to shift into that. And now all of the background in history, in literature, in politics, in, in, econo in economics, in all of that helps and informs a lot of, mm. of what I do as a therapist or as a teacher. Well, you, you write about religion as it shows up in psychotherapeutic containers. And, and I'm curious for anybody who doesn't, I'm, I'm assuming that most people that stumble on this podcast or have been listening are already well aware of why that is. But for anybody that's not, what, what do we mean when we talk about religion, spirituality? Let's kind of move into that territory. And uh... Yeah. I think from a clinical perspective is, and the way I understand it and see it, is something that connects us to a larger reality that can provide meaning, that can provide ways of transforming ourselves or of, of becoming more wise, of learning from us, of deepening our relationship to other people. I think spirituality or religion or whatever pursuit that involves uh, a relationship with a higher reality or larger reality mm -hmm. or being cannot forget that or on, yeah, cannot forget that we are humans with human relationships. So I think any pursuit like that should bring us closer to being more understanding and compassionate with with others and with ourselves and i think in as a therapist i i don't have any agenda on that i have of course my own belief system and my own conflicts with my history with spirituality or religion but that does not matter when i'm when i'm a therapist it matters so that it doesn't spill over the person's mm -hmm. process but i think if someone comes from a very strict organized religion well what provides meaning for them what provides comfort how how is their relationship with that community impacted their life how do they grow from there uh what meaning can they draw from that and uh and how is, how has that helped them uh to have a relationship with a non-material reality a larger reality that can provide all of these wonderful experiences and 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 connections. And if someone comes from the other extreme, sure, we have the same questions. It's just how is your particular relationship with these forces that are larger than our, in, in our, our individual selves? So even if someone is an atheist, great. But what inspires them? What provides meaning in their life? What it can be art, it can be science, it can be nature, it can be activism, it can be their, their, their relationship with their family, it can be anything. Just what helps them enter that area of their life where they they seek meaning and they seek connection and they seek transformation. It's funny as you were saying that I was thinking about the the shadow side to therapy and the yeah the issues with therapy and certainly the issues with religion. And I thought about this. We'll, we'll get into defining these terms, but the, a lot of times we 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 have a kind of traditional Jungian idea called the mother complex or the father com or a complex. And interestingly enough, people who want nothing to be like a particular parent, you know, people will say like, I don't yeah. want to be like my mother. They can't stand it when they behave like their mother, or their father, like, God, I don't like that. Yeah. I can't believe that shit. I'm... And it reminds me a little bit of the atheist that I don't think the atheist is, is conscious of how much their life is structured around divinity and God in, in a kind of, negative uh negative, negative way, way. In, in the same way that a parent can be rebelled against and then the kid says i want nothing to do with that or the adult says i want nothing to do with that and then they structure their lives on that figure just the opposite of it's still based mm -hmm. and grounded in that figure so th there's an interplay i, I just uh, this is maybe a side i don't, I don't want to derail us but that's an interesting dynamic between theism and atheism or religion and a religion or religion and spirituality yeah. uh 
But this, these, this content, this material, religious material. Let's define that real quick. What? Because you, you, you did a great job in your paper defining spirituality and religion. Would you, would you do that for a moment? Let us know what you mean when you say those two things. Yeah, I'll just try to be as eloquent as I was in my dissertation. You were, yeah. <laughs> I don't promise. I, I can't <laughs> promise I'll do that by uh, right now. But um, the, the purpose of that part of the dissertation was to draw several distinctions between religion, which is usually, well, it's organized and it has a belief system, a moral code, uh, a structure, a hierarchy. And it's usually a belief in something, in, a, in either a deity, a god, or a supernatural force or being. Those were the main characteristics for defining religion. Certainly religion can contain spirituality and spiritual practices. And then there was a differentiation with mysticism as this experience mm-hmm. of a connection with, a, with, a, with divinity. So it's something that divinity or this encounter provides or provokes to us. We don't have any control in a mystic encounter. And it has to do with this revelation and connection with, um, with a divine being. I used William James's perspective on that. And then spirituality is this unstructured uh, set of practices, beliefs, ideas, perspectives that do not necessarily need to be organized in a hierarchy, in, an, in a structure, in an organization, but they do make us relate to the non-material aspects in life. They make us seek meaning. They make us connect with larger realities that inspire us and that can contain us. And they involve our subjective experience in, in our everyday life. And, and so a lot of different practices can enter that arena in spirituality. And then in the dissertation, there was another concept to define. I didn't want to do that, but uh, my advisor suggested that, it, that I did it, which was to define the differences with the, with the New Age movement, yeah. which I think the New Age movement was more a cultural phenomenon that involved spiritual practices. And, um, and well, I didn't want to do it because that was not the purpose of the, of the dissertation. But I agreed that, uh, that it was important to differentiate all of this. And then what's, what really interests me afterwards, because after the dissertation, some years after, I started writing for Thresholds, uh, the column Spiritually Ambivalent Therapist. Mm. And in that column, what int- that, that column is the continuation of that dissertation. And in that column, what really interests me is to explore the shadow aspects of spirituality, because the more uncontained it becomes and the less structure and the less inner work and psychological work that accompanies a spiritual practice, I think, increases the danger of the shadow of spirituality that can be very, very destructive and malignant. Uh, Because everything, as you said, with the complexes, carries a shadow too absolutely everything does and we it's engaging and knowing that there are destructive aspects inside of us and they can hide they can absolutely camouflage in a, in a spiritual practice and then we can enter these ideas of well you know i've been practicing meditation for 20 30 years of course i have conflict with this person because they have no practice whatsoever and they have no wisdom and we can become this horrible human that just you know points and devalues everyone because they they're not as wise as us that's crap or we can dehumanize others or we can think that we have power over the material and we don't the material world exists and it has its rules and and we need to follow them and and Mm. and that's that um so i think the and i think it can also lead to very dangerous uh hazards uh health hazards mental health hazards too can certainly lead to psychosis, for example, and a psychotic break, or or to to ignoring personality conflicts that then will attack and pollute our relationships, or ignoring any any yeah any mental health issue that needs our attention, and it can be of course accompanied by these spiritual perspectives. But I think it's as dangerous as for a therapist to say to someone, well, in your religion you should be doing this. We're not ordained ministers in that religion. Why are we you know, saying that people in that religion should behave X or Y? And I think it's as dangerous when someone from another aspect or area from psychotherapy says, oh, no, no, you know, this depression is nothing but uh, this thing that you need to resolve this way. And it's usually with me. So I think that the most destructive aspect of 
uh, after a hefty price, of course. The most destructive aspect of, of spirituality is the rise of charlatans. Yeah. And they're unchecked, un, uncontained, unhinged, and they prey on the vulnerability and the pain that we all carry. And in moments of crisis, if mo in moments of pain, in moments of transition, um, we are extremely vulnerable to this, to, to falling into these, um, into these traps, into the, these predators that, that disguise themselves as you know, these enlightened beings, and they're actually uh, quite destructive. So I want to tread lightly here, but. <clears throat> It is concerning. You know, I do think there are limitations to what therapy can accomplish. I do think there are concerns about therapeutic containers. And I think any mindful system will be self-reflective enough to be critical of its shadow side. Yeah. But we are seeing a lot of shaman these days. And I, again, I, I, I've talked to a lot of folks in this territory, and most of them would say, any shaman they know would never call themselves a shaman. But we're, so this is getting into the new age piece and to therapy, coaching, and like all these various um, helping professions or healing professions. It, it is interesting that when you get outside of a particular initiation process, because I think that's what your training is. I mean, I think it's a, yeah. a, a pretty effective in, initiation process. And, and for a lot of people that aren't willing to go through the training um, and they find other pathways and are, now I don't, I want to be clear here because I don't want to say that somebody who's quote personally anointed is not effective, but I would say that when you, you I, and I think you'd agree, but you'd help me out that when you don't have those healthy containers to engender a sense of criticism, self-criticism, and self-analysis in, a, in a, a community, I think you're at risk of having some pretty shadowy aspects of self come out. And let's, let's kind of tend to that a little bit. What do you mean when you're talking yeah. about that? Absolutely. That's exactly what I mean. And I think that with all of this mix of different areas and helping professions, I, I don't think any of any human practice that is safe and contained and, and is aiming towards growth is wrong. There are many different traditions, and I don't think that anyone can say this tradition is wrong or whatever. Absolutely not. But I think one of the things that we need to understand is that there's a lot of value in knowing what we can't do, what we're not trained to do, what we are unable or uneducated to do, or uninterested. For example, I work with teenagers. I love working with teenagers. I cannot work with children. I love children, but I can't work with them. I, I either can play with children or and engage a child in a relationship and just be you know, loving to a child, but I can't think clinically and do that at the same time. That's one of my limitations. And I tend to get um, in conflict, inner conflict with the parents because a child, well, usually reflects a lot of what's happening in the mm -hmm. family. So that's mm -hmm. my limitation. If somebody brings me a child and I say, oh, yeah, I'll work with the child because I'm a therapist, I'm doing something that goes against my training because I'm not trained in child therapy and against myself. So I will hurt them. And, you know, they can do whatever. They're, they're living their life and their story, but I will hurt them. So I think understanding that if you're a coach, that's perfect. What is the scope of coaching? If you are a meditation teacher, a yoga teacher, uh, what, any discipline that one chooses perfect what is the scope of that what is the reach of that and then that's the value in creating community whenever you can't attend to something you can absolutely refer to someone that you know is trustworthy and safe regarding the different traditions and being a shaman or not i don't have enough information to comment on that but i do think that there's risks in appropriating methods and traditions from a different culture that we haven't um, mm -hmm. trained in that we don't belong to and that we just take them and put them in another place and then exploit them. I think human creativity is limitless and we can create a wide range of tools, perspectives, and, and, and we can go to what works for us and what we have access and what we can enter in a relationship with. That's one of the things too that I think prevents the harm is to know that we are in a relationship to spirituality to therapy. We're not that. 
or we're not the role. I'm not the therapist. I, I act as a therapist and I behave as a therapist when I'm in my office, but I get out of there and I'm, I'm me. Um, and I think that can help us to know that it's a relationship with, uh, I will quote Jung too, uh, after saying that it's quite annoying to do that. But when, after his confrontation with the unconscious, when he says, well, that those years gave me everything I needed mm -hmm. to bring this psychology forward. And the rest of my life was a translation of, of all of that, that experience into to making it analytical psychology. I think that's what, what an initiation is. We train and whatever that training, however that training impacts us for three, four, whatever years, then we have the rest of our lives to unpack that. And we need to use the rest of our life to unpack that. Otherwise, we, the, the moment someone says, I don't need supervision, I don't need to learn anything else, I have all of the answers, uh, I know exactly what to do, I think that's when we need to run away. Mm -hmm. And one of the seminars that I taught at the Jung Center came, uh, was born out of anger with all of these charlatans and people that were just harming others in very horrible and pernicious ways, particularly here, here in Monterrey, I knew of, of some organizations that were doing horrible things. And um, would you say something about not, not specific, but what do you mean when you say horrible things? Well, just, you know, bringing people that are as everyone in pain, looking for answers in a crisis and then just you know selling them a weekend workshop and then telling them if you want the second level you need to bring 10 more people mm -hmm. and you will get you'll get your heal this healing if you bring x amount of people or you need to cut ties with everyone around you of course a lot of times we need to cut ties with with hurtful people around us but you can't tell someone just, you know you need to stop talking to this person today it's a decision they need to claim and make and, and execute in mm -hmm. their own timing so they were doing all of this severing from their communities and uh, exploiting them economically, psychologically. And well, that was in the most destructive side, but I also saw a lot of naive, naive um, hurtful, naive practices. So I got really angry and made a seminar that's called, um, it addresses spiritual inflation. So mm. going back to Jungian psychology, whenever the unconscious floods um, our consciousness and floods our ego. It can possess our ego. It can make our ego feel it has all of this power and it, when it doesn't. We need a healthy ego to engage in all of this work. Otherwise, we'll just be destroyed. And uh, so I made that seminar on inflation and the fairy tale that I used to explain that was, or to explore that, was the fisherman's wife, mm. um, King Midas, and uh, the spirit in the bottle to exemplify the relationship that we have with the sacred and how exploited if we can be, for example, in the fisherman's wife or how hyper fascinated we can be. And we, we learn something and we want to, to, we want to put everything into that. So we touch everything and we make it into gold, uh, making it fit this wonderful idea that we discovered. Mm -hmm. But then like in the, in the myth, King Midas loses the ability to eat because he touches food and he turns that into gold. So we lose the ability to be nourished by what we're learning. And he also turns his daughter into gold. So he can't relate to her. And so we lose the ability to relate to others. And then Spirit in a Bottle, which is a, a story that can help us relate to a spiritual, uh, to, to a spiritual nature or to spirit and not be consumed or destroyed by it. And one of my academic influences for engaging in spirituality is Dr. David Tasty. Uh, and uh, his work on spirituality, I think, is very serious, very rigorous, very open, very respectful. And, uh, and it can be a very safe container to, to embark upon all Say of Say his name again. Different journeys. David Tasty. T-A-C-E-Y. He wrote a book called The Spiritual Revolution, The Darkening Spirit, Disease as gods, um, and, uh, and he uses Jungian perspectives into exploring all of this world. I've got to write that down everywhere. I like hearing people that have influenced folks, certainly on that subject. Uh, so you, you, uh, I, I want to get into talking about a, a couple of these concepts, in particular the archetype, because that's the other thing you said that when you yeah. have. Uh, an image of the archetype it's in large part misunderstood it's colloquially used yeah. that so would you kind of extend that and help us understand what you mean when you say archetype and then it seems like a good opportunity to take your invitation and go into some of these fairy tales if that's cool with you absolutely yes Great. um 
one of my lecture, one of the lecturers in one of my classes at Essex said that the word archetypal was a wretched, horrible word. And I agree with her. Uh, because it's a way of justifying, it's a word that justifies any argument that we make without <laughs> solid grounding because it's archetypal. So the, I think the problem with ar the word archetype is that Jung throughout the years provides different, quite different definitions for the concept. Mm -hmm. the, the conceptual analysis of archetype is it, it's just headache inducing because he starts talking about it in one way and then I he goes it all the years. way to yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> and then just he gets into the archetypal image and that's great and blah 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 so the way i understand archetypes is they are this universal themes autonomous human themes that we will all face we will all face an archetypal experience, and there is absolutely nothing we can do to stop that. But I think that Jung's concept of the archetypal image and the symbols are very useful to translate that and ground that experience into the particular way I am experiencing that mm -hmm. archetypal phenomenon. We can never understand or know the archetype because it is unknowable. It is, you can't represent it, it's, it's infinite. So I always do the same example. If if you're in a group of people and you say mother, we'll all have a very different idea and symbol and association with very core elements to them, but we'll have very very different individualized um, images of mother. So that symbol and that archetypal image, of course, connects us to this archetype, but that archetype is still big, infinite, unknowable. And I think what's valuable from archetypal theory is to understand how these experiences impact us, form our personality, our worldview, our relationships, our developmental history, certainly. And these archetypes can be need to be renewed because we these archetypal experiences need to be renewed because we will never fully grasp or understand an archetype. And where I think it can be quite dangerous is when we drive archetype into stereotype. And then we just say, well, it, it has to be like this because it's the archetype. Okay, what does that mean? Or when we go from the individual to the archetypal in a straight, direct, uninterrupted line, but we have the familiar stuff, the society, culture, history, the everything. There's a lot of, of layers that we need to connect and cover before we can assume something is just a random or autonomous manifestation of the archetype. And... Um, and why, what I do find fascinating about fairy tales is that a lot of these universal um, experiences will be found in, in fairy tales and they repeat themselves and they're, it's quite powerful. I, uh, I was once teaching a seminar on fairy tales and I used uh, a, a story uh, from Hungary. And, uh, and so I, I said that story and then someone in the class raised their hand and said, we have the exact same to story in a village an hour away from here but it has this name and it was just, it was electrifying because mm -hmm. that's, that's how woven all of this is. And I think fairy tales and myths can help us contain and, and explore the archetypal and then translate it into our personal lives. Um, but, but we need to ground all of that into our personal life, our individual life, because if not, we will we'll identify with the archetype. And we'll become inflated, completely inflated. And sadly, I've seen that far too many times. W would you give an example? When I went to, to Mexico City to listen to Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolen, uh, she gave a conference for her book, Le Wise Like a Tree, like a tree I think is the name of the book. And uh, so it was a book presentation, and then she gave a workshop, and I was just excited beyond words to be in front of someone like that and she was fantastic but i i got really annoyed because i was on the line for getting um, my book signed i brought her memoir called crossing to avalon because it's one of the books but it's the first book that i discovered from her and i've always loved the myth and lore of arthurian legend and the yeah. myths of avalon and all of that so i was in line and this person next uh, behind me just you know, she, this person starts saying that she read goddesses in every woman and that she was ex-goddess or ex-goddess and, and, and that no one can, can, could 
challenge her, question her, because when she was in line with this goddess, she was being the goddess herself. And I was like, okay, well, great for you. So then she you know, touches my, my arm and goes like, oh, I, I never expected to see a young person here. And I was like, oh, well, I'm a fan of Dr. Bolen, so I'm really happy to be here. And she says, oh, you brought that book. I said, yes. And she immediately answered, um, did you understand that book? And I said, yes. And then she said, well, if you need any help, uh, I can help you translate that book because you're so naive and you're so young that you won't be able to, to understand that. <laughs> and speaking of mother complexes, one of the very good things, one of the very good things my mother did and taught me was how to defend myself. My mother has a very sophisticated verbal defense that is just lightning rod and brutal. And, and I learned from the best. Wow. So I just told her, um, you're embarrassing yourself. So I advise you to be quiet. And, uh, and she did. And, <laughs> and, I got my, and I got my autograph and I left. And whatever was happening with this person, fine. You know, but again, the idea of going, I would never, ever, if I see someone reading a book I love, I would never go and tell them, did you understand this? I think I need to explain this to you. You're right, quite yeah. Why would someone do that? Like, why would you? And, 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 and saying, oh, I am the archetype. I am the mm-hmm. father figure of X, Y, Z. No, fuck off. You're not that. You're a human being. And, and, and that's it. And, and I think that anger can be very grounding. And, um, and also not taking ourselves seriously at all. And that's another thing that I've learned from... I think almost every figure that I admire is that at some point they openly admit they don't know everything and they mm-hmm. are still growing and evolving. I've heard Dr. Clarissa Pinkola say that, Andrew Samuel say that, Dr. Bulen say that, teachers in my training here and in Essex saying that, figures that I admire that I do not sadly do not know, but I, that I admire, uh, singers, writers, um, people like that. And the other thing is that, uh, that I find in all of them is that they they have moments where they do not take their, se- their, their self seriously at all, where they can just have fun, uh, laugh at themselves and laugh at whatever it is that they're doing. And, um, and, that's, and they can be playful. So whenever we stop, I yeah. think, whenever we stop being playful Humor. and curious, we're dead. Yeah. It's funny because one of the things I think you're talking about is that when the individual becomes identified with a particular image, you know, what if we could, you know, dig into this from afar, one of her sins in this moment is that she's projecting all over you. This, this yeah. has nothing to do with you and yeah. everything to do with her um, pseudo somewhat conscious self that she has to become this way in a compensatory fashion, seemingly to make up for something that she feels, which is the problem. Like, it, yeah. it, it it becomes the compensation as opposed to actually getting curious with our own inferiority. And yeah. where did you, have you looked into the, I think it's the Dunning Kruger effect. Have you heard about this? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. I love cognitive biases because they really ground us in our humanity. Yeah. Like, this is not a sophisticated <laughs> argument you're making. You know, your brain is playing a dark trick on you and making you think you're smart. So that I, I'm fascinated by cognitive biases because we all engage in them daily. Yes. So and yeah, it's, it's exactly that. Well, it, it's funny to me that that humility is one of those... Um, I would I would say a, a healthy spirituality has humor and humility. Yeah. Absolutely. And so when you become rigid and fixed, you're 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 the opposite. I mean, you you are the inflated Aries, you know, as opposed to the curious kind of uh, the 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 figure that recognizes that the uh, reality is far beyond my conceptualization. And if that doesn't humble you, then something's <laughs> something's <laughs> off. <laughs> Yes. And and we and we go through this where we're solipsistic and we're kind of like we become activated or identified with the yeah. rage or with the whatever. But even back to our conversation in therapy, somebody becomes activated by a history. You know, I do something to a patient of mine that that activates a wound, and I did that thing. I I I wasn't present. I was dismissive. I was misaligned or misattuned. And then they hopefully can say, hey, that happened. And I say, yeah, it did. Tell me about it. 
and we yeah. we process through as opposed to doubling down and and i that's the, the kind of identification with that no i'm don't you talk shit or you know I, this is the thing that gets to me is the total blank what did that do for you and not validating the person's experience which is yeah. ultimately incredibly wounding from an attachment lens so this this cognitive bias piece is uh is is a good example by the way of of and and good on you for <laughs> for for standing up to that or i guess st standing it down at such a young age too uh, yeah that's entirely my mother's uh training and uh, and i'm really grateful to her because she she's a force to be reckoned with in that sense and i've been able to do that since i'm very young because of 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 her and uh and my sister's the same in that in that way. So it I think it also this naive idea that everyone will have a good intention, it's also quite dangerous yeah. because we will go to these places and someone will project things on us. And and it's not it's not it's not to ostracize or or you know attack this person. It's just to understand that someone will project something onto you. And we have our strategies, each of us, to work well, first to know that that's happening. Do not engage with that and try to stop it. I'm not comfortable with this conversation anymore. Please stop talking. You could say that, or you could be a little bit more of an asshole as I, as I was. Um, <laughs> but it's, we, we also have this responsibility of protecting ourselves and not entering into war or into conflict with others to do so. And, uh, and I think by, yes, by, by knowing that we have all of these biases ourselves too, that can be quite, quite humbling. And, and, and I think fairy tales, Fairy tales also help us because they detach us a, a bit from the conflict and then we can make a connection with the characters and then we can go, oh, I'm doing exactly this. I am. And, and the thing that I love about fairy tales from a Jungian perspective is that they, the Jungian perspective, well, perspectives, there are several plural perspectives on, on Jungian interpretation of fairy tales. But the, one of the core elements is that we have every single character inside of us. So the character that is absolutely hateful and horrible to you speaks about something that you experience or do too, or that you could do if the context shifts. And I think that's really interesting to explore all of these different aspects and see the fairy tale. What if I am, for example, in Godfather Dead, the, 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 the healer that gets this gift from death and knows how to heal people. But yeah. what, you know, what if I am, turning the bed around and keeping things alive that shouldn't stay alive. We, we all do that at times. Or what if I am the father that brought a new being into life and had no idea how to care for them and had to go and fetch a, a, a godfather or a godmother for, for the baby because they were, well, how many times have we created things in our lives and we're not able to tend to them or care for them and, 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 and we're looking for someone or something to help us. But at some point, we need to be responsible for that. Or what if we're the king, the arrogant king, and we're going to the therapist, for example, and saying, well, you need to heal me now. Or we go to a doctor and say, you need to take care of this for me in this instant. And I'll reward you with money and riches and prestige. Well, I, I can't turn the bed. Death is at the side of the bed, and I can't turn it. But a lot of times we fall into this omnipotence. And what I, what I love about that fairy tale is how brutal the ending is, because death takes that person into the cave and says i'll give you another chance with the candle and as soon as death is about to turn on the candle he or she turns it around and mm -hmm. uh and you know kills him and uh i forgot the word in english uh, how do you say when you oh, blow off the candle mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. so sorry when i'm in mexico and i look around <laughs> my spanish and english get mixed together um yeah. so so yeah and 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 i think it's really powerful to see it that way or the other fairy tale that I love that I told you, Sleeping Beauty, been my favorite. Uh, when I was little, I had a, an obsession. Well, not, I, I still have it till this day. But when I was very little, I had an obsession with Maleficent, the witch from the, mm -hmm. the Sleeping Beauty. I was just absolutely obsessed with that character. It was one of my favorite, favorite characters. But then the fairy tale, it's about not inviting the 13 fairies. And what's fascinating about that symbolism is that 13 used to be a bad luck number because it creates chaos, a new order. It brings unwanted but necessary elements. And I think if, if we explore that through a fairy tale, it's easier to know, okay, which unwanted but necessary elements do I not bring 
instead of saying, oh, yes, well, you're resistant to A, B, C, D, or you're stuck in blah, blah, blah. It, I think fairy tales soften the judgment mm. and, and allow for a playful ex- exploration, but deep, nonetheless, exploration of what's happening with us. So before, because I would, for some reason, it would be great if we could go into Sleeping Beauty. I, I, I know we yeah. said either way, but... What's the difference between mythology and fairy tales? Yeah. Well, myths were the myths came usually from religions or from the narrative of a culture to explain mm-hmm. the world and 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 to explain a particular phenomenon. And then it evolved because of course we don't explain physical phenomena through myths now. Uh, and it, it it talked about this relationship either with the gods or superior beings or creation or what happens in life after death uh, or and it usually they usually came come from a particular culture in, in in time and they had that purpose. Fairy tales are more varied in the number of versions that they have. Uh, they crop up everywhere and uh, myths tend to crop up everywhere with similar subjects too. But fairy tales are less, I don't know how to explain or use the word, but fairy tales can be more either playful or um, aimed either for teaching children or adults different things and um, educational in that sense. And they also evolve a lot. Uh, but I think myths are more in connection to, a, a, yeah, to, to, to the gods and to yeah. explain the world. And fairy tales are just, characters fantasy characters that are experiencing a conflict and resolving a conflict what i what i hear and what you're saying is that we, we of course humans we narrativize we we, we are constantly yeah. narrativizing we're you Absolutely and i everything yeah we could say that in our conversation right now you there's the story that's happening between we uh both of us Absolutely. then there's the stories that are happening in our minds about what yeah. you're thinking and what I'm thinking and then my memories and my conclusions and what I like and what I don't and all that's happening, right? And in both of our uh, consciousnesses. And and that over time, dynamics get narrativized in a, in a reduced form. Like it, it, this is the, the, the clearest way we can articulate a drama or a dynamic. Yeah. Or, or an eventuality that it sounds to me like at times fairy tales are, for example, the Godfather Death is kind of a cautionary tale about um, taking divine gifts and abusing them for egoic reasons. You know, that I, I start to personally benefit from something that is um, a, a kind of nature of the mystery. If I have a gift, yeah. you know, if if I'm a healer or if I'm uh, if I'm really good at numbers, you know, and and then I shift that to start to my humanness comes out, and I may take advantage of other people as a result of that gift, yeah. and and so that's that's a there's a notable and um, important ethical and moral dynamic that shows up in fairy tales. But mm-hmm. the other thing that's so interesting to me is that it 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 reve- I think one of the things you were getting at they reveal interior like it's not so much about exteriorizing your dynamics it's interior dynamics that that yeah. i have death and life and uh the humble part and the abusive part and the the dominant part the like all those things exist in me and i can read a fairy tale and see myself reflected not some foolish um story that existed you know so Okay, let's let's jump to Sleeping Beauty because I want to. We've got like twenty five minutes, and I want to be aware of uh, <laughs> of how we dig into this. Will you set us up like what? Why Sleeping Beauty is? Because obviously, Sleeping Beauty is a story that has risen to the surface. It's one yeah. of the most popular. I, I bet a lot. Of, I have heard of Godfather Death. I hadn't read it until you and I talked, but I'd certainly been through Sleeping Beauty many times in my life, and it should be noted. It's very different than Disney's version. Um, so yes. set us up on Sleeping Beauty. 
why that's important to pay attention to and how you might use that narrative in your individual life and as a therapist? I think it's what fascinates me about that story is the lo- longing and promise of new life, the the longing that the queen and the king have. The kingdom is just, it's grown, it's grown, it's solid, it's prosperous, but they long for new life. And we all, I think we've all found moments in our lives where we're longing for that new life and it doesn't arrive. And then it does. And then we invite everyone to see that new life. But I'm also, I love, and it's fascinating that that new life will grow and change from what we thought it would be. So the idea of the 13th fairy not being invited, so death not being invited, chaos not being invited, change, mm-hmm. death of the different stages, you know, the way this new life appeared and happened will die and change, and it will be reborn into something new, but it will stop being what it originally was. So the idea of trying to, uh, to outwit destiny in that sense and saying this will never change i am strong enough and i will outwit it's a disservice to us and to this new life and destiny will always catch up with us so i i love the symbolism of the element that it's not being invited Mm -hmm. it's actually what needed to be invited to avoid the curse and to avoid Actually, it's not. It, it's experienced as a curse because we didn't invite it in the first place. Mm-hmm. And then the twelfth fairy. What What's also fascinating is that the twelfth fairy gives the gift to soften the curse. So it it gives the gift of re, the gift of redemption because of course we will not invite the thirteenth fairy as many times, and then we will just you know crash into reality. But there's also the opportunity of redemption, and then I love the the symbolism too of the whole kingdom and Sleeping Beauty just being sleep, asleep, because life stops to grow whenever we don't allow the chaotic and renewing elements to come and the scary elements to come. And mm-hmm. life just stops and it sleeps and it appears to be fine, but things are stuck. And the promise of new life ends up being something that just stagnates. And uh, and so I love the the, the story because of of having to be wise enough to invite the uninvited and and to to bring the the outsider the odd element out the scary parts and uh and it's also i think a cautionary tale because well the king um burns all of the spinning wheels thinking that by doing that uh the curse will be avoided so it, we all do that we're all evasive all the time I'm yeah. not just not going to think about that. I'm not going to talk about this issue. I'm not going to explore this emotion that it's cropping up and I don't want to invite it. So I'm not thinking about this. I just burn the spinning wheel, but then it crops and it, and it just, you know, explodes in our faces and we feel cursed by it. And a new element needs to come and awa- awaken us from, from that slumber. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and yet, and when absolute, the, the, when I analyze sleeping beauty, I, I, take one of the Grimm's versions and, um, and, and, or any version, but usually one of the Grimm's, which is completely different from, um, from the Disney version of Sleeping right. Beauty. But, uh, and that, Sleep, I was influenced by Sleeping Beauty, the Disney version, because of my love for Maleficent. And I always loved the villains. I always loved them. <laughs> and I think they're very interesting figures because they make the whole action um, happen. And Maleficent was this, I think on misunderstood figure. Of course, she was evil, but uh, but I loved her power, her intensity, her yes, her elegance, and 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 I think there's a seductive aspect too that we need to be wary in in all of these different forces. But it's an invitation to bring the unwanted, the dangerous, the scary, the chaotic into la- into our life and make room for it. Otherwise, it'll curse us, or we will feel it's cursing us. So there's a um, there's a religious tradition out there that has banished evil to the underworld and refuses to look at this figure they call Satan, and I'm I'm wondering about how we map that on, because there there's something I th- what you're saying is is extremely important to be mindful of. What happens when the religion says that the evil is relegated and to be judged and pushed down to the underworld and in fact if you commune with that you're you're a bad person and you're kicked out of the tribe 
I wonder how you can what, what, riff on that for a second. Without going, absolutely, without going into any doctrine or criticizing any tradition, I think that one of the functions of religion is to address the destructive aspects in, in human beings. And I think that with any element, if we ignore something, then we just make it more powerful. And we need to understand that we have um, shortcomings, we have destructive elements, we have things that we're ashamed of. We have a shadow in the Jungian sense. And if the shadow is unattended and not worked and not assumed, not, not explored and not, and, we, and if we don't assume that, because I, I also, I don't like at all the, psycholo the psychological idea of integrating one's shadow. Like I'm integrated now, so I can do whatever the hell I want because my shadow is now perfectly in balance and making me more wonderful than ever. I hate that idea because the shadow it's treacherous in that sense. And I also hate the idea of idealizing the shadow. Oh, all of these repressed aspects that I have and are very good are in shadow. Absolutely. We have repressed as aspects that um, out of shame couldn't come out and we have them in shadow and, and there's gold in the shadow. Absolutely. But there is absolutely shit and destructive aspects <laughs> in shadow. So if we lose that from our side, I think we're, it's more dangerous because if I lose sight of, my aggression, my anger, what I do to feel safe when I'm feeling threatened, um, the mischievous aspects that we all have, the manipulative, manipulative aspects that we all have, if we lose sight of that, then we'll enact them, absolutely. So I think that in any tradition, it will be very wise to have a framework to deal with the destructive elements that humanity has, and we can't expect we, we can't escape those instructive elements. Well, and I, I'll, I'll emphasize something you were saying is it, it's not so much the critique of a tradition because mm -hmm. these principles or dynamics show up in every tradition. And that, that I think is the real unconscious piece is it's not, I mean, Christianity is a beautiful tradition. It, it, it so is psychology and so is biology but when these forces that are universal in every single human's biology psychology sociology relationships and spirituality when those are left unattended they they're acted out and identified with in that particular tradition so you can have a fundamentalist biologist that absolutely we can take the 13th fairy to, to the paradigm revolution that Thomas Kuhn wrote about. And whenever a discipline is in a paradigm shift process and in a transition, and they go like, no, this is how it's always been done. And none of these new experiences or discoveries are going to, are going to change our tradition. That's not inviting the 13th fairy into a scientific mm. discipline because it will be chaotic, random, and it will shift things, absolutely. But without paradigm shifts, there, there are no innovations whatsoever. So yeah, any human discipline that is rigid and stops being playful and stops addressing at the same time the destructive nature that we carry, I think, is doomed to face the 13th, the 13th fairy's curse. This is good shorthand. I think you've given us a bit of gold in the 13th fairy piece. Well, so just paying attention to time, I want to move into maybe how how do we do that because it to me that that really gets at maybe one of the themes that we're really exploring is how to invite the 13th fairy uh, because when we were talking about kind of certainly a number of religious traditions that um, that hide because i i in christianity there's a um there is one narrative that says with, that when christ was crucified, he went down to the underworld. And not a lot of people talk about that. And what does that even mean? Why in the hell is you know the chosen uh, son of God venturing down to the underworld? Well, maybe we might have a really healthy tradition there if we did what Christ does in some way, when we kill off certain parts of ourselves and we venture down into the depths of chaos and disorder and uh, depression and inferiority, 
and we recollect important parts that kind of maybe make us more whole so we can reemerge as to prove, to, to embody that existence of the transcendent or uh, however we want to call it, that, that, that remains pretty healthy. But when it's, I, I, I never want to be anything like that. I don't want to say those words. Like the first time when I was, um, when I was in my twenties, I was, uh, I, I had a pretty solid meditation practice for many years. And I met with an old friend of mine and I told her that I was meditating and she kind of backed up and was like, uh, looked noticeably concerned. And I said, what are you, what what are you, I mean, like I had horns in my head and, and she said, oh, we don't do that. You know, we don't, uh, we, we pray. I said, what do you think meditation is? You know, like, so, so listening to yourself, um, is problematic. And another example of this, I had, I had a, a, I've said this before on the podcast, but a friend of mine once uh, completed suicide. She very, very isolated, very quiet, uh, went away and killed herself. And when I went to the funeral, the, the, the minister was saying, never go within, don't go within, go to the book, trust the book. That's the path. And I thought, whoa, man, that is some really dangerous rhetoric uh, that that can create a dependency on institution very quickly and that 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 person at best is incredibly unconscious of the consequences of that kind of paradigm so i'm i'm curious what you what you recommend i mean how do we look at the 13th fairy and allow for chaos in our lives yeah uh I think that's one of the dangers of any discipline or area or tradition dealing with things that are that are out of scope. So if we're facing depression, we need to address that from a multiple perspective or any issue in mental health, but we need to have some, we, we need to have treatment for that, for mm-hmm. everything that causes pain and suffering. And other stories, uh, the trips to the underworld are, they're present in every single mythology and in every single tradition and in every single story. And one, I think one way would be to differentiate evil acts or horrible and, and, and unconscious acts from the chaotic, misunderstood, um, shortcomings, destructive aspects that we have. We're not doing that because we're evil. And it's not that we're exploring our evil in that sense but we're exploring our humanity and well it's very hard to to recommend something if someone says there are there is no shadow so for shadow work what i can recommend is that well we need to assume that we have it that we won't solve it that that we need to really have the stomach to explore our own darkness and pain and suffering and and there's a matter of timing. It's not that sometimes it's not time for that. And it's fine. We can leave that for another moment. That we'll have trips to the underworld. Absolutely. And differentiating underworld from hell might help. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my, my previous workshop at the Jung Center was an introduction to the trips to the underworld. And I'm doing Inanna's descent in summer to talk about the, the descent to the underworld and meeting all of these repressed aspects of ourselves that are in pain. And it's just, if we, I think that if we really need, if, if we want to help others and help ourselves, we need to be wary of how we can hurt ourselves and hurt others. That's the best way, I think, to prevent damage. Um, for example, as therapists, if I don't invite the 13th fairy, well, I don't, I'm assuming that the therapy will never end and it will end one day, either in good terms, in bad terms, but it has an expiration date and an ending. And it needs to be shaped towards that. Um, if I don't invite the 13th fairy, then whenever there is chaos in our communication, in our relationship, in the way I'm understanding this person, when I get stuck with, uh, with the client and I have no idea how to do that, if I don't invite that fairy, I can go like, well, this is resistance, or let's just try this, let's try this, let's try this. And I can insist a lot of and push back. And instead of going to a supervisor, 
and going like, well, I'm, I'm stuck and I have no idea what to do and I'm frustrated and this is where I am. And I think that's how the 13 Ferry allows us to untangle that. Or when we're really angry or hateful to, towards someone we love dearly, well, or envious of them, well, what is it that I'm really craving that I'm envying? Or why am I mm-hmm. envious of this person? Just And it's really uncomfortable to do it. But I think that, for example, if I would envy, or when I envy someone in my life, I, of course, it's uncomfortable, but it's, it's, I think it's better to say, well, yes, I do. And I want to explore this with someone that's safe to explore it. And then I can really find out what is it that I envy about this person and not act that envy with the person. Because, as I was telling you with my sophisticated verbal defense, if, I, if envy gets a hold of that, I can really devalue that person that is not doing anything to me. It's just that I'm really hateful towards them because they're making me uncomfortable and it's not their fault. And I can absolutely do that. And I'm responsible of that. So I think I can be a better friend by knowing that I can hurt my friend if I envy them instead of saying, no, 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 I'll never envy anyone. Well, of course I will. I'm human. And I I don't know who it was. I forgot the author's name, but there's there's a quote from an author that says, I am a human and nothing human is foreign to me or something along those lines. And everything, you know, it's ter- human Tertullian. I, yeah, I think, yeah. I think that, yeah, nothing human is alien to me. Yeah, something like that. And and, and I, I, I should know the name of the author because I, I keep that um, phrase a lot in mind. <laughs> to know that anything we, we experience as, hum- as humans belongs to us. The great and wonderful yeah. and also the complicated the shameful and the destructive i'm fairly certain i butchered that name by the way i think so I think, i'll look for it <laughs> I, think I, I think i really fucked that up uh, okay we've got <laughs> we've got to start closing out but you said something yeah. about inana and i'm wondering if you can kind of direct us certainly i'll include a link in the show notes but could you oh, talk about you. your workshop that's happening this summer yeah I'm going to do a, a myth interpretation of the myth of Inanna. Her, there, there are many myths and stories of Inanna, which is she's the goddess of, of heaven and earth in uh, Sumerian culture and one of the oldest, ancient, uh, most ancient myths. And, uh, and the analysis will be from, her, from the particular myth that's called the descent of Inanna. So when she goes into the underworld to meet her twin sister and she crosses seven gates of the underworld, meets her twin sister, dies in the underworld, and then, and then is reborn and comes back as queen of heaven and earth that now has spent time in the underworld. Mm. So the analysis will be to explore our uh, trips to this underworld. What does every gate mean and represent in our path of renouncing one uh, moment in life and be renewed by the other? And then how do we engage all of these repressed and really angry aspects that we have inside of us because we've repressed them for so long? So it's going to be an analysis of that. Awesome. And then what about how to get a hold of you? You got a website, I, I know, but uh, it'll be below. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have a website, but uh, my email and my Twitter handle. Uh, okay. that, <laughs> I'll send that to you on the email. Good. And uh, yeah. And no, I, I, I don't. I think I should, but yeah. I don't have a website or anything like that. No. Yeah, you should. Um, I, I I have this contradicting side that, that I love to talk and I love to meet people and I love to do these kinds of things, but I then I also like I, I hate to be exposed in a website <laughs> or things. Like that. But my Twitter, but my Twitter is my personal account, so I I sometimes talk about therapy there. Yeah. But I usually just talk about nonsense or things that interest me in that moment or. Just, you know, it's not, it's not a serious account, just a warning. You bring the humor. Yeah. Good. And the, fan, the, the fandom to things that are not yes. uh, ther- therapy. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jose, thank you so much for arranging the time today. And I, I appreciate this uh, descent into your world and the exploration of these subjects. I, it feels so good to be reconnecting with these ideas on just what we're talking about around religion and uh, spirituality, certainly. But the fairy tale piece i'm i'm glad that we're finally that i finally brought this into the conversation on the podcast and uh i'm so thankful to michael for uh pointing me in your direction and i'm grateful for your time thank you thank you for inviting me thank you too for michael for putting in the good word i hope i didn't disappoint his recommendation or disappoint you uh and it's 
just I, I love doing this. So whenever whenever you want to follow up, I'm more than happy to find yeah. new ways of communicating and collaborating. So thank you very much. Love